Tuesday morning. Uh, there is something I'd like to tell you that there has been a review of your uh, project papers. Oh, you have to see me, no? Yeah. There has been a review of all your webinar one after another webinar papers because the marks given to your batch is unbelievable it has become like something like your board exams everybody is getting 90s so it is becoming worthless taking examinations and giving marks like what the board examinations of schools are giving and i believe this year there have been about 400 cases of 100% marks in the class 12 <laughs> is becoming worthless. So what will be the consequence is that all engineering colleges and call, all undergraduate courses will be conducting their own examinations for admission. Your class 12 exams will be absolutely of no value because there are boys and girls who are getting 100 or 100 in the exams. That means it is stating that the student is perfect. No student is perfect. No teacher is perfect. No student is perfect. Nobody is 100% perfect. Everybody has its drawbacks instead. So it's impossible that somebody should be given 100 out of 100. In fact, the cutoff in some colleges in Delhi is 99. So it's not a correct procedure of encouraging talent. What can be done so same thing is now creeping into colleges and it is more so because there are various institutions under one head of imu and each college wants its students to be at the forefront in academics so it makes it very difficult so a number of papers have been recalled for rechecking by other faculty and possibly they will go up to the headquarters. Possibly, I'm not sure. And regarding opening of institutions, first year classes will begin on the 16th. That is on next Monday or coming Monday, 16th. And I hope something happens in 1st of December, at least the first batch of boys and girls can should come into the campus. Otherwise, the campus looks absolutely a haunted campus. There is overgrowth near the hostels. The field has become like a jungle, except the administrative building and the vicinity. They have been very tidy, very clean, very well sanitized. Everything looks very good as you enter the college. But I have not been deep inside behind the hostels. So I wonder what that condition is like. I'll be going to office on 12th to find out what is the condition like. And we'll have to decide about what is the next program. Because, so sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, Somia Mukherjee, uh, I pressed the wrong button. To ask him to uh, try again. I pressed the wrong button. Did, Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, now he's okay. It's okay. So I'm just keeping on clicking with my mouse and it came down. Today, what we are going to deal with, I think 35 boys are here. Very good. 35 students. Today, what we are going to deal with is first thing, we are going to go a little off the topic, off the syllabus. And I'm going to explain a particular aspect of engineering which all of you must be very thorough with. And this part of engineering is not there in your syllabus, but I am taking a step in this direction just to make sure that you understand the basics of engineering so well that your future understanding of machines become very simple. See, any machine that operates, that is a running machine, especially in the rotary machines like motors, engines, shafts, pumps, anything. They are rotary. Of course, in the case of diesel engines, 
they are reciprocating and rotary, both, combination of both. Now, fiction is one area which is existent in all machines. And we as engineers try to minimize the friction within that machine. In other words, to make it as mechanically efficient as possible. And one of the ways to do it is to add the right lubricant between two running surfaces. And this lubricant can be of various types and grades. Maybe grease, it may be oil, it may be air, it may be anything. So our objective as engineers is to ensure satisfactory lubrication between running surfaces to ensure that the engine or the machine runs for a long, long time, our objective. And we need to understand where a machine fails most commonly. A machine fails more commonly at the bearings. That means at the points where it is a rotating body is supported. The stationary body of a machine does not give any problem or almost no problem unless exceptional. But the moving body inside that particular machine is supported on bearings. And these bearings are prone to wear and tear because they are rubbing surfaces. And we intend to reduce that friction. In a rotating body, you have a condition called hydrodynamic lubrication. It comes in a regime of lubrication where lubrication by itself can be segregated into different levels. One level, the first level is rubbing between the two surfaces and the surfaces are dry. There is no lubrication really. It is the maximum friction that can take place and it depends on the coefficient of friction of the surfaces. All right. Now you may have a little bit of oil between the two surfaces where some friction has been reduced and it is still making contact with surface to surface. That means metal to metal surface contact. And there is some amount of oil which, but which is not enough to separate the two surfaces. All right. So this condition where there is some oil and some parts are still touching each other while moving against each other is called boundary lubrication. It is not a very healthy form of lubrication and it is avoided at best. So this is the first stage of the lubrication. The second stage is between a complete film between the surfaces in some places and some places where there is boundary lubrication. So this is called the mixed zone of lubrication. That is the second zone. The third zone is called elastohydrodynamic lubrication. To understand lacto elastohydrodynamic lubrication, you need to first understand hydrodynamic lubrication. Hydrodynamic lubrication, you see the words hydrodynamic. Hydro means a fluid, a liquid. Dynamic means motion. That means movement of the body. So while it is moving, it provides this fluid which comes between the running surfaces and a complete separation of the two running surfaces come about. And this is also called full fluid film lubrication. F, F, F lubrication. Full fluid film lubrication. That means there is a film of oil between the two running surfaces. All right. So this is the ideal condition. And this can happen in a shaft which is rotating in a bearing. And how does it happen? Even the oil is poured from the top. It is not poured at much of pressure. If it is just poured, it's enough. So the oil comes into the shaft, between the shaft and the bearing. This oil has a this oil has an affinity or it has an adhesive property with steel. All iron or steels have an affinity of adhering with the oil. I'll give you an example. Suppose you have a steel surface and you throw water on it and you take a cloth and you wipe it off. 99.9% .9 of the water will be wiped off. Maybe there's a trace of vapor on the surface, but 99% is rubbed off. Now you pour a cup of oil on the surface 
and then you rub it with a cloth. I don't think much of the oil will be wiped off. There will be still a layer of oil on the surface which will not go easily. This is the adhesive property of the oil with the steel. Right? And this is taken advantage of in our engineering aspects, in our engineering machines where two surfaces have to rub against each other. So in hydrodynamic lubrication, what really happens is when the shaft rotates, the oil adheres to the surface partly and it adheres to the bearing surface also. So when the shaft rotates, it draws the oil under the shaft and lifts the shaft so that there is a film of oil under the shaft. So while it is continuously rotating, the oil is dragged in and made into a film of oil under the shaft. So in real terms, the shaft is not resting on the metal surface. It is lifted up. It has levitated above the shaft with an oil film. Now this oil film depends on certain factors. Let us proceed with our PowerPoint program to make it even more clear. So this is your PowerPoint 5. We have started on the PowerPoint 5. And the first part I want to explain to you is lubrication briefly. It is not a very long, I think it has got one, two, three, four, four plates, just four plates. And after that, we go back into our subject of description of parts. So let's have a look at it. Lubrication in machinery, the lubrication regime, that means everything about lubrication in machinery comprises of the following levels. One is boundary lubrication, which I told you, it has partial metal to metal contact when rubbing against each other. Then you have a mixed region or mixed lubrication, which is partly boundary lubrication and partly film lubrication, right? That is sometimes at some places it is making contact, some places it's not making contact. That is in the mid range or unstable region. Elasto-hydrodynamic lubrication is a condition where if you see a shaft is rotating and the oil underneath is trapped. This oil is a liquid which is incompressible. You cannot compress liquid. You can compress air, you can compress a gas, but you cannot compress a liquid. Uh, Practically, it is, you know, 0.001% or so compressible. There will be some compression. It is like compressing steel. Steel also can be compressed. But that is almost a theoretical concept. In practice, it cannot be compressed. So because it cannot be compressed, it rebounds onto the metal which is pressing it and it causes a depression in the metal within its elasticity. That means there is a deformation of the surface of the shaft within elastic limit. That means in few microns. And this deformation accommodates the lubricating oil which is trapped and keeps the separation between the two layers. That means the two surfaces. Once it passes that phase, the elasticity restores the shape of the shaft when it moves on. So momentarily, there is a slight deformation of the surface, which is called elasto-hydrodynamic lubrication. It is microscopic in nature and not something we need to deal with it in day-to-day -day lives. What we need to deal about is boundary lubrication and full film lubrication. These are the two aspects most relevant to us in our practical operations. Okay. Now, Full film lubrication means complete separation of the two surfaces which are rubbing against each other by a film of oil. And this is achieved in a rotating shaft while it is in a bearing. Let's have a look at the diagram. Oh, first we'll see the three or four phases that are there. This diagram you don't need to study, don't need to mug up, don't need to copy. It is just a, almost like general knowledge information to you. So here is your lubrication regime. You see the friction level is very high when it is at the boundary stay level stage. It will be even higher. Actually, this should have come like that with another curve on this side where there is no oil at all. That is where the maximum 
friction will take place. So boundary friction, boundary lubrication has a lot of friction. In the mixed lubrication, it is a mixture of boundary and film lubrication. Film lubrication starts from this point onwards. So this is the elasto hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic stage. And finally, what you have is hydrodynamic. In real terms, we need to deal with either boundary or hydromyodynamic. These are the two that matter to us in our practical operations of machinery. You will see we have given a cap, cam tappet. That means lubrication between a cam and tappet is a very difficult proposition because oil gets squeezed out and the load is very high. Surface area is very small. So that is why the lubrication of a cam and tappet is very difficult. Piston rings, depending on the, the profile of the piston ring, how much oil can be wedged in will decide whether it is film lubrication or in the mixed range. And engine bearings, they will all have hydrodynamic lubrication. In fact, any pump bearing, engine bearing, any shaft that is rotating and oil is provided, it is expected to have hydrodynamic lubrication. Next diagram is what is of most relevant. This is the diagram I have drawn and I am presenting to you. Have this diagram instilled in your minds anytime you wish to explain what is hydrodynamic lubrication. Ah, Rudraj has a question. Of course, excuse me, sir, water can be, of course, water can be used as a lubricant. In fact, it is a very common lubricant. It has, it is, it is performing as a lubricant while you don't even know. In fact, earlier, we used to have a propeller shaft which used to be in water lubricated lignum, lignum vitae bearings. You see, there is a special kind of wood which is supported, which is supporting the propeller shaft. And water was allowed inside there, and that used to be the lubricant. If you run without water, that lignum vitae bearing will get damaged. Same with certain centrifugal pumps you need to have a certain lubricant, uh, water as a lubricant. Even the bearing seals, yeah, sorry, even the shaft seals. We are going a little off topic, but Rudraj needs to be convinced. Water is an important lubricant in many issues. One of them is the gland packing of your centrifugal pumps, of your ordinary pumps. You see, there's a gland packing which you tighten and it stops the leakage. Stopping the leakage is more likely to cause the damage. A trace of leakage is better. Why? The water which is seeping out performs the seal, performs the lubrication between the seal and the shaft. So water is very much a lubricant in certain cases. Okay. So be aware of that. So let's get back to our diagram here. So what I've shown you is a diagram with a Bearing as a concept is a con who's come now, mind 47. Should we allow him 35? Who is this? Shashank Shekhar. This is a warning. Next time you will not be allowed. You are a disturbance to the class. 947. Okay. Uh, 930, 47. Okay. Up to 950, we can allow 30, 40, 50. 20 minutes is too much. After 20 minutes, no more. So you have 36 people. Okay. So let's have a look at this bearing here. This is the bearing and the shaft is right inside. Now, once you understand this thoroughly, your knowledge about bearings will be very, very thorough. But you need to absorb this information and not mug up this information. Absorb this. Let it be the understanding in engineering within you. Any bearing, anywhere, any bearing, where it is a journal bearing, First, now who's calling? Ashok Bhatt, director is calling. Hello, good morning, sir. Sorry, I was taking class. So I had to stop. Oh my goodness, I have not yet got the information. Oh, oh. Oh, he just in his maybe early 40s or late 30s. Oh my God, this is a shock. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Oh, my goodness. The very bad news. We have very, very bad news. 
very bad news. I don't know how to deal with it now. Sumesh Divedi is dead. I don't know. Uh, director is informed. I don't know. I don't know. Can't imagine. All right, let's finish this plate. We will finish this class within one hour. We will not take the whole 9.30 to 10.30. So we will finish this class as early. But there is very bad news. Sumesh Divedi, I hope you know who he is. He was fleet management uh, recruitment officer from Kolkata. And that is why I have got a letter from uh, Pradeep Nair in Mumbai from fleet management. Sumesh Divedi's letter has not come. Sumesh Divedi is... I don't believe how... I don't know. I am very, very upset about this. He was very young. He was very active for our batch, for our college, for recruiting boys. I think everybody knows who Sumesh Divedi from your batch. I'll ask Sachin to find out. Give me one minute, huh? Just uh, let me ask. I'll just put a message to Sachin. It is very sad to hear about Sumedhi. He is telling me huh, that he did. How will this happen? My goodness, I didn't know about it. The director is informing me. It's Nandu's Now the whole thing is going around. Uh, uh, good morning, Krishnandu. I heard just now from Mr. Okay, from director that Sumesh Tiveji is not there. No more. I don't know. He is, I'm, I'm told he's expired. Hmm. No, I have not been getting any responses from Sumesh, but the letter has now come from Mumbai Pradeep Nair. And that uh, recruitment will continue with fleet management and directly from Mumbai. So Kolkata office is now closed. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can get any inform further information. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Yes, yes, definitely, very bad news. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. Now all the calls are coming for Sumesh Divedi. He said, how do you? I have no idea, sir. Now this is Mahesh Kumar he has given. It makes us feeling sick, anxious, and scared of losing everyone you love. He was my elder brother. I will always remember him as the nicest. He was a great mentor. How did it happen? We don't know. Oh. Oh, my God. Let me see if there's any information from our uh, website. Between has one only all. Oh, U.S. Coast Guard, COC, lot of Anglo Eastern problems. Let me see, uh, uh, how did this happen? Very sad news, Sumesh Devi, the head of FML Kolkata, passed away today evening at 19.53 hours. He was suffering from COVID-19. So now let me inform to Ashok Bhal.
so he had covid 19 so he has died out of covid my goodness very very sad so we now we know why he has gone let me forward this to krishnandu because he wanted to know Why is my phone become so slow, yeah? Or you and okay, let's continue with the class. But sorry, today Tuesday, tenth, very bad news. Sumesh Jivedi, fleet management recruitment officer from Kolkata, is no more. and he as i got just now the information that he has died due to covid 19 be very very careful boys it can attack anybody whether you are young or not it does not care so that is the way it is uh, very very upsetting but fleet management has not stopped recruiting our boys they have asked for our boys from mumbai now so mumbai officer will be conducting the online test i have asked the 2017 entry batch for 70 cadets name list and like previous year i hope they will take 30 35 boys as they do normally year after year but it is very very upsetting very very upsetting so let's proceed with the subject we will close the class after 1 hour by 10:30 so this is the requirement in a journal bearing while the shaft rotates and this oil which enters from this passage on top of the main bearing tends to go to the right hand side as it goes to the right hand side it enters a path which is like a wedge and that wedge is shown in an enlarged form right here this is the the profile or the volume of oil that is lodged inside this space between the shaft and the bearing you see the lower part has got a very thin layer and upper on top it depend on how much clearance is there between the side wall and the shaft so this oil has a tendency to adhere to the shaft surface and when the shaft rotates it drags the oil underneath and forms a film this is the fundamental explanation now for this to happen there are four important parameters which must be fulfilled four important parameters which must be fulfilled to enable that film of oil to form underneath the shaft what are those four parameters number 1 viscosity of the lubricating oil the most important property of a lubricating oil is the viscosity lubricating oils on board the ship when you go on ship you will find at least 15 to 20 different lubricating oils each oil is for a particular machine or machines so that oil has specifications which relate to viscosity which relates to viscosity index which it talks to density and other parameters also that the most important property is viscosity and this is graded in different it is something like saying the viscosity of the crankcase oil is sae 40 where the viscosity of the cylinder lubricating oil is sae 50 where the viscosity of a gear oil is sae 90 so these are different grades of oil which have different viscosity levels so a bearing designer will design a bearing and he will specify what viscosity of the oil is required for his particular bearing for a turbocharger bearing you need a very thin oil whereas for a crankcase you need a thick oil whereas for a gearbox you need a thicker oil so each of them have different grades of viscosity levels so for this particular bearing that you discuss a particular grade of viscosity is essential the oil must not be too thin and it must not be too thick that's the concept and in very basic language the oil must not be too thick for the bearing 
and it must not be too thin for the bearing. Normally, with slow speed or slow running bearing, the oil is thicker. And for high speed movement of shaft, the oil is thinner. That is the fundamental distinction. So viscosity is the number one parameter which has to be satisfactory. Number two is the speed of the shaft. The speed of the shaft has to be of a minimum value. You cannot have it rotating very slowly and expect that oil film to occur. It has to be moving at certain speed to draw that oil underneath before that oil can be squeezed out from the sides. That is it. And uh, so speed is the second factor and it determines whether the bearing will run satisfactory or not. Number three is the clearance. You see on actually this diagram has got an excessive amount of clearance. The clearance will indicate that the shaft is capable of lifting up. It lifts up by only a few microns, maybe 15 to 20 microns. So the oil film underneath is only a few microns. And this film thickness will change depending on the viscosity of the oil, depending on the speed of the oil, depending on the load of the engine. So these four parameters are of critical importance. This clearance on top, what you see as C, is for two reasons. One is to allow the shaft to rise and have an oil film which of a few microns. But the clearance is much larger than few microns. That larger clearance allows the oil to come in. If the shaft rises completely, then no oil will be able to come in. So that clearance has to give provision for entry of the lubricating oil and also provision for allowing the shaft to lift to allow the film to form underneath the shaft. All right. Now, if this full film fluid lubrication, which is your hydrodynamic lubrication, is permitted, there will be no wear and tear of the shaft because the two surfaces are completely separate. All right. So there will be no wear of the shaft. They are not touching each other. But in spite of this hydrodynamic lubrication being satisfactory, viscosity being satisfactory, speed being satisfactory, clearance being satisfactory, load also being satisfactory, there is still wear down of the bearing. All right. Why is that so? You see, when an engine is stopped, when the lubricating oil pressure is zero, pump is stopped, then the shaft rests on the metal to metal surfaces. When the engine starts, even with the oil there at the oil wedge, it will be first metal to metal rubbing and then the oil film forms. So this initial stage, when there is a startup of any machine, that is the time you have the wear. And you also have a wear when the engine stops. When the engine stops, the engine does not stop instantaneously. It comes down to a slow speed and then finally it stops, all right? During this very slow speed, oil is not able to come along with the shaft. So that is that last stage of stopping, the metal to metal rub against each other. So maximum wear down takes place in a rotating machine is during starting and during stopping, because that is the time there is no oil film between the contact surfaces. It is only when it is running that there is a film of oil and there is a separation of surfaces. So it is better to keep an engine or a machine running continuously than to continuously have stop and start, stop and start, stop and start, stop and start. Stop and start. More damage is taking place. To Bhardwaj, it is very sad, sir, our deep condolence with him and his family. May so listen. Really very true. I am also very upset with this. And I want to conclude the class by 10.30 to find out more about his family. But then class is also important. Remember, your focus has to continue. No matter what happens, what difficulties come, what issues arise, you have to proceed with your objective regarding fulfilling your career. That is how life is. Life has to go on. You cannot stop it. We all feel upset about him. He was a fr very good friend of mine also. And last evening he died, and this morning I'm getting information from director is very, very upsetting. He has died of COVID-19. That means he must have fallen in for a few days. 
anyway after the class we'll get into the subject matter let us finish our class so i hope you boys are able to focus because i am finding it difficult to focus on the subject right now so i hope you understand what is hydrodynamic lubrication in a bearing and it largely relates to journal bearing that means the shaft inside a bearing and there are four parameters which have to be fulfilled to ensure satisfactory operation and health condition of that bearing and most failure in machines is is at the bearing because that is the place where they have maximum wear and tear all right so let's move on so here is the diagram which i've taken from the internet and uh, the shaft as you see is rotating in the opposite direction to what i had it is just to show you how the oil pressure is under the shaft while it is rotating so it is not exactly under the shaft it is slightly angled from the shaft so the maximum pressure is slightly offset because when the shaft starts rotating it tends to climb onto the bearing first as it tries to climb onto the bearing it draws the oil so that is the point <coughs> where the oil comes in and where the shaft is lifted off that is the point where the maximum pressure is if you rotate the shaft in the opposite direction then the profile will also be in the opposite direction but this diagram is not so relevant to us as of now most important is this one remember it is an oil wedge that is necessary to allow the film to transport itself to underside of the bearing okay so get this diagram well understood and the four parameters so the last item is the load no bearing how good it is how good the viscosity oil clearance everything may be perfect but you if you overload it then that bearing will not take the it will not survive because every bearing is designed for a specified load you cannot overload a bearing no matter how good the lubricating oil is and how good <coughs> the shaft speed is this has to be within limits so these are the four parameters four parameters which will ensure satisfactory operation of a journal bearing viscosity speed clearance and load do not forget it any time you are asked you should be able to answer so we spent almost half an hour on this connecting rods let us have a few words of our description of command of our components the connecting rod everybody knows facilitates conversion of reciprocating forces and movement from piston to rotating power in the crankshaft everybody knows the whole purpose of the connecting rod is to translate reciprocating motion into rotary motion second point is these are machined forgings shaped at each end that means the top end as well as the bottom end to accommodate the two bearings the top end bearing and the bottom end bearings an oil hole is made through the connecting rod for lubricating oil passage up or down in two stroke and up or down only in two stroke and only up in the four stroke engine you see the gudgeon pin also needs lubrication just as much as the crosshead bearing needs lubrication the uh, the two engine the gudgeon pin also needs lubrication so where is the oil going to come from the oil is going to come from the main bearing on the main bearing keep there is a oil hole with a pipe connected and this helps in allowing the oil to travel through the main bearing through and uh, lubricates the main bearing of course like just now what i showed you apart from that the shaft as the journal itself has got a hole so the oil enters that hole passes through the journal then there is a hole drilled in the crank web it passes through the crank web and then there is a hole drilled inside the crank pin so it comes through the crank pin and from the radial side there is a hole drilled for the oil to emerge at the crank pin surface now this bearing bottom end bearing is on top of the crank pin so this bottom end bearing has also got a hole in the white metal thin shell bearing and the connecting rod so that the oil goes up to the gudgeon pin or it goes up to the crosshead bearing at the crosshead bearing you have a booster 
that booster is like a reciprocating pump which is worked by the angularity movement of the crosshead and the connecting rod and this pump will draw that oil and force that oil under the bearing under hydraulic pressure because i had explained to you earlier that lubrication of the crosshead bearing is a very difficult proposition because at all times the weight of the piston rod gas pressure or compression pressure is acting on the bearing and at no time is there any relief so that the oil can come in but this relief exists in the trunk type of engine between the gajin pin and the bush during the induction stroke or during the induction stroke means during the inspiration that means when the connecting rod is pulling down the piston let's have a look at the diagram <clears throat> so this is your connecting rod for a four stroke engine this is the connecting rod for a four stroke engine and you see this is the bottom end bearing and the oil which comes into the crank pin travels up through this narrow passage inside the connecting rod and in some cases you have a non return valve here in my experience i have never found an on return valve here but lot of advanced books say that there is a valve there so i have written over here a non return valve is sometimes fitted to prevent draining out of the oil in the line let's hide let's uh, make this word bold is sometimes that means it is not always there remember is sometimes fitted to prevent draining out of the oil so the oil travels up to this and what i have missed out is a dotted line from here up to the bearing and sometimes it goes out of the bearing to a passage to a pump and that pump is attached actually to the crosshead and this crosshead allows for takes the oil from there and under hydraulic pressure or under boost pressure is pushed onto the bearing this is in main engines and i don't have any diagram to show you but remember a booster pump may be used to pump the oil underside other than that in the sulzer type of engine you have elbow pipes which moves and connects the pipeline from bnw and sulzer from top and i have a diagram here which allows the oil to come in and then lubricates the crosshead but lubrication part of it is not right now important because we have to draw the entire lubricating oil line to make it explanatory but right now just the bare construction of the connecting rod will be deemed adequate so you see the cross section of the connecting rod is round in its nature with a hole with a hole drilled right through the center so that hole is the passage for the oil to either come up or go down in some engines the oil is supplied from top it goes down to the bottom end bearings for lubrication and in some cases the oil comes through the crankshaft through the crank pin and up to the connecting rod so this is a connecting rod representation of a two stroke engine okay any questions the con rod we continue length of the connecting rods are made short as possible to reduce height of the engine see the engine when it is a long stroke engine the piston rod is increased in length all right that is to bring the piston right down and right up now if you keep increasing the piston rod without changing the length of the connecting rod then the height of the engine becomes very very tall and then the ship's height will also get increased the accommodation spaces will also increase so to avoid such a situation the piston rod cannot be shortened because the stroke has to be long enough you can shorten the connecting rod to such an extent that it is little more than the stroke of the engine the stroke is from tdc to bdc or from extreme left or to extreme right in the circle of the crank pin movement so it has to be just above the tdc point to accommodate the crosshead the crosshead cannot come into the space of the rotation so that connecting rod while it is at bdc the lower bottom end bearing is at bdc so the rod has to extend beyond the stroke and a little more to accommodate the crosshead 
So that is the shortest that a connecting rod can be reduced to. It cannot be shortened any further. This is one point. Second point is, when the piston is at mid-stroke, then the connecting rod is at its maximum angularity. All right? And this maximum angularity means the bottom end bearing is horizontally farthest away from the center on a horizontal plane. So, because of this extreme angularity, the transverse force also becomes very large. So, if you shorten the connecting rod, the transverse force also becomes very large. So, keep that in mind. So, that is why we need to shorten the connecting rod to reduce the height of the engine. But there are other penalties where the transverse force becomes wrong and you need to make the A-frames and casings much, much more robust to take the transverse force. Okay. Now, for four-stroke engines, if there are V-type engines, now how will you have two connecting rods attached to one crank pin bearing? Now, there are various methods where both are having separate bottom end bearings, but both are fitted onto one crank pin. This requires the pistons to be a little offset. They are not in the same line in the transverse direction. They are slightly offset. So the center line of the piston and connecting rod falls on the crank pin at a certain position and the center line of the piston and connecting rod of the other side unit falls at a different position. So they fall at different position on the crank pin which is reasonably long. So both the bearings can be accommodated on one crank pin. So this is one design. Another design, when the crank pin cannot be afforded to be made very long, it has to be short, but the two bearings have to be accommodated. You have a master and slave arrangement. Let's have a look at it. Okay, now we are discussing four-stroke connecting rod. We just now discussed two-stroke connecting rod. In four-stroke engines, the connecting rod performs the same function as the two-stroke engines, except that it is directly connected to the piston through a gudgeon pin. You see, if you are asked a question, oh, my mind is not being focused. Uh, if you are asked a question, what is the difference between a connecting rod of a two-stroke engine and a connecting rod of a four-stroke engine? The answer is very long. It is not short. First answer you need to give is a connecting rod is connected to the crosshead in the case of a two-stroke engine. And in the four-stroke engine or trunk type of engine, the connecting rod is connected to the piston through a gudgeon pin. At the bottom end, both are connected to the crank pin. But at the top end, one is connected to the crosshead, one is connected to the piston. Here, second factor, the structure of the connecting rod is also different. Why? You see, the structure of a connecting rod in a two-stroke, I showed you, is a round in section, which makes it a heavy body and definitely very robust. But we could have made it lighter by machining it or having a forging, which is like a four-stroke engine. But we don't. We have a round section. In the case of a four-stroke or trunk type of engine, the uh, connecting rod is an I-section girder or H-section girder. Why is it made I-section or H-section? The reason is, see, medium-speed engines and high-speed engines, they're rotating at a very high speed. Okay. Now, the connecting rod has a certain mass much like the mass of the piston, connecting rod also has a mass. And this connecting rod has a whipping action. A whipping action means it's reciprocating as well as rotating. So it is a sort of an oval reaction. If the mass is very high, then the forces will become very high because along with the piston, the connecting rod is also subject to acceleration and deceleration. And due to this acceleration and deceleration during its movement, <clears throat> the forces generated 
are dependent on the mass and the speed of the piston. All right. So piston speed and mass determine the inertia forces of that connecting rod. And because of these inertia forces, the, the rod will have a tendency to bend in both directions while it is rotating. <clears throat> not out of compressive forces that <coughs> not out of compressive forces that arise. <coughs> I hope <clears throat> I am not getting the virus. <clears throat> See, there are compressive forces on the piston, therefore compressive forces on the connecting rod. Apart from this, while the connecting rod is revolving, <clears throat> revolving meaning moving up and down at the same time rotating, the mass of the connecting rod can be assumed to be acting at the center of gravity of that connecting rod. So that will be moving in a non-circular and non-reciprocating. It is a combination of reciprocating and rotating body. So this is side-to-side -side thrusting of the connecting rod. And that will cause the connecting rod to bend in either direction. So these forces are very severe. So these have to be accounted for over and above the compressive forces arising from the gas pressures on top of the cylinder. So the connecting rod has to be made strong and at the same time it has to be very light. So how can you achieve that? The only way to achieve it is to have an I-section girder. This I-section or H-section girder is light in construction and also very, very strong. It gives enormous strength. So that is why your connecting rod in a four-stroke or trunk type of engine has an eye section girder. I hope it is very clear because this is not going to be repeated later. So there have been questions that if it was lighter and stronger, why couldn't the two-stroke engine be made the same way? See, the bottom line is money. The cost of making an eye section girder of equal strength is much more than getting the savings in material from that connecting rod which is round in section. Mm -hmm. So for purposes of economy and non-necessity, the girder of the connecting rod of two-stroke engine is left into a forging which is round in section. So it is easier to have a constructed round section connecting rod than to have an I section connection rod. So that is why a two, two stroke engine has a round connecting rod and a four stroke engine has an I section connecting rod. I hope it is reasonably well understood. Now, here you have a connecting rod for a four stroke engine. Here you have a <coughs> for a four stroke engine. Now, this connecting rod, what you see here, is got a bronze bush inside. And inside layer of the bush at the bottom, you see there are two grooves. Like much like this one here, there are grooves on the interside. Now, I told you the oil is only able to enter that space during the induction stroke. So when the oil does enter, for the remaining three strokes, there is no oil being fed into that bush. So that oil can be retained in that bush by having grooves on the internal walls. So these grooves will partly retain and provide that oil during the remaining three strokes. So that is why this bush which is fitted will have a groove or grooves inside on the internal surface wall of the bronze bush. Sometimes this bronze bush is locked in place. Locked in place means there is a grub screw. I hope you understand what is a grub screw. You have a cylindrical body fitted into another cylindrical body and the two of them, between the jointing part of two of them, you have a small hole drilled and it is threaded. And after it is threaded, a small screw is fitted in to lock the two of them together. So it will not rotate inside, it will not come out also. So both the supports are provided by one single grub screw. 
but then this grub screw also has to be fitted with complete confidence so that it does not loosen out at a later stage. There is no locking for the grub screw except cyanocryolate. Cyanocryolate is the same thing as Fevequick. Everybody must be knowing what is Fevequick. This Fevequick is actually called, and the chemical is cyanocryolate. Cryolate. Cryolate or cryolate? Cyanocryolate. So this holds the threads in place without loosening. In fact, I use cyanocryolate or Fevequick in so many applications in my home. Any repair required, one drop of cyanocryolate and the repair is done. Very convenient. So this grub screw is sometimes you use cyanocryolate and the term that is used on board the ship for this chemical is not Fevequick. It is Loctite. L-O-C-T-I-T-E. -T -T -E. So that is the term used for cyanocryolate, used on board ships for various purposes. Even rubber seal rings, you cut and join with cyanocryolate. Because some of the rubbers, you don't have the original. So over a period of time, they become stretched and they have a permanent set. But they still have a little bit of elasticity left. And if you put it on, it becomes loose. So we cut it, cut off a piece and join the two accurately, very accurately, center to center, and then reuse that rubber ring. It works. It works to a good extent and quite satisfactory. In fact, a rubber ring which is joined with cyanocrylate, you break it, it will break from anywhere else except that jointing. It is so perfect in joint. So here, this is the connecting rod, and these are the lower pieces. And you will see that there are thin shell bearings that are used. Thin shell bearings are bearings which are only two discs, which are in halves. They are two halves, and these thin shells are put together to form a bearing. The diameter of the thin shell bearings a little more than the keeps of the bearings. Do you understand what I am saying? The diameter of the thin shells are a little more than the keeps which hold the bearing microscopically more and when the keeps are tightened with the bottom end bearing bolts they have a slight deformation this deformation is within the elastic limits which will not cause any detrimental effect to the surface of the bearing where the shaft is rested or makes contact this is within the elastic limits but the intention for this is to make sure that the bearing inside doesn't start rotating on its own. So the bearing has to be held tight while the shaft inside is rotating and not cause the bearing shells to rotate inside. This is provided by the help of what is called NIP, NIP. Sometimes it is called CRUSH, C-R-U-S-H. This NIP and CRUSH is the added dimension on the shin shell over and above the bearing keeps to allow the bearing keeps to squeeze the shells and compress them within elastic limits and hold them tightly in place so that the shells do not rotate while the engine is running all right so this is your cross section of the eye section of the girder of the connecting rod and it is common to most or almost all connecting rods. Now this is the second design of a connecting rod where the bearing keep is at an angle. There is not much difference between this one and that one, only that the crankcase space is made in such a way that this sort of a connecting rod has become necessary to facilitate opening and putting back of the bearings. If it is down below and the space is very cramped, it gets very difficult for maintenance to enable maintenance on these bearings where the crankcase spaces are very, very compact. You have the bearings fitted in a slant and the performance is no way lesser than the normal bearings. A second factor is introduced in this kind of bearing. You see where the bearing keep meets the connecting rod, the faces over here are flat faces. Okay, so this flat face 
is indicative of possible transverse movement of the two facers okay so the bearing boards which are actually holding the two pieces together are subject to fluctuating tensile stresses as well as shear forces because of this we have a possibility of the bottom end bearing board failing much more early to prevent this transverse movement or lateral movement of one bearing face against another you have the surface serrated serrated means with a zigzag formation of the mating faces so this prevents any transverse movement of the two halves of the bearing to move sideways against each other so once that is made possible then the bolt which is holding the two pieces together will not be subject to any shearing stress it will be subject to only tensile stress and that also fluctuating tensile stresses because at each time the engine moves or the firing takes place the forces and rotation of the connecting rod will cause fluctuating stresses on the bottom end bearing boards when most of the components it is a steady tensile stress wherever a bolt is fitted suppose a crankcase door is fitted against the wall you tighten it and there is only tensile stress it is not a fluctuating stress it is not that the stress is increasing decreasing increasing decreasing but in the bottom end bearing boards this condition exists where the tensile stress is increasing decreasing increasing decreasing so this gives rise to possible fatigue failure and uh, if this bolt is subject to further shearing stress then the condition of a fatigue failure is even enhanced so to avoid this shear stress on the uh, bolt bottom end bearing bolt the two faces of the bearing that mean the keep and the connecting rod are made serrated so the mating faces are rigidly locked against each other before the the bottom end bearing bolts are tightened so there is considerable reduction in possible failures of the bolts in the third case what you see here is a situation where the width of the bearing is much larger than the bore of the cylinder line out so this makes it impossible to draw out the piston with the connector rod from the top of the engine so you need an arrangement where the bearing and the connecting rod can be separated where the bottom end bearing and the connecting rod can be separated so this separation of the bottom end bearing from the connecting rod is made possible by means of a flange attachment so apart from the bearing board you have flange boards these flange boards can be opened out and the bearing can be removed from the crankcase door and the piston with the connecting rod can be lifted up from the top so this is another arrangement and this arrangement is not so common though i have we have seen in one occasion where we had to remove the bottom end bearing from the connecting rod from the cross, from the crankcase door and the piston and connecting rod from the top after removing the cylinder head so this kind of a bearing with a flanged connection to the bearing is where the cylinder bore is smaller than the diameter of the bottom end bearing okay now these are the three designs that you've seen and a fourth design i have also included which is generally for a v type engine for a v type engine you need two pistons fitted on two separate connecting rods but the bottom of the connecting rod has to be fitted on one crank pin so how is that achieved like i told you you can have transversely the pistons offset so the center line of the piston and connecting rod fall at one part of the connect of the crank pin and the center line of the piston and connecting rod of the other one fall at a different point so both of them will have two separate bearing which are both fitted onto the bottom end on the crank pin other than that you can have one master rod and one slave rod the slave rod is connected to the master rod by means of a link pin 
So this is the diagram of a V-type engine which has a connecting rod consisting of the master rod and slave rod. You see, the slave rod is not rigidly fixed to the bearing. It has a link pin, so it can swivel at the same time rotate. So this part also moves, and this part also moves. But when the force is required to be transmitted, it will transmit through the pin onto the crank pin. So this is the connecting rod for a V-type engine where you have only one bottom end bearing with two connecting rods and it is accommodated. All right, let's move on. That does your connecting rod. Next, what we have? Oh, we have a little more information. The top end bearing, also referred to as the small end bearing, sometimes it is called a wrist pin bearing and sometimes it is called gajin pin bearing. The item is the same, but it is given different names in different books, different places, different conditions, different environment. The gajin pin is generally made of a forged steel. It is hardened and it is polished to a mirror finish. It is hardened by means of night riding. It is possibly hardened by uh, what is called carburizing and it is hardened by tempering or oil quenching. <clears throat> In your material science, you must have learnt all these procedures of heat treatment of steels. And it's a very important chapter to understand the performance, ability and strength of any component that is used in an engine. <clears throat> Okay, this gajin pin may be fixed in the piston boss or it may be free to rotate. See, when it is in a room temperature, the gajin pin is fixed inside the piston. And I had given you a diagram earlier about a four-stroke piston and two different cross sections. One is showing the gajin pin in a horizontal position and one is showing the piston in the axial position, gajin pin. So this gajin pin, when it is fitted inside the piston, at the position where it, the piston is held, is called the boss. So sometimes it is referred to as boss and strut. The strut is the beam. And in this case, the beam is the connected, is the gajin pin. So you have the boss, which is holding the gajin pin, and the gajin pin, which acts as a strut on which the connecting rod is fitted on. Okay. Now, how do we fit a gajin pin inside a piston? The piston is mostly aluminium alloy and the gajin pin is a forged steel with a very smooth surface. So is the piston at the internal portion of the gajin pin fitting is also a very smooth surface. So we take that piston and put it in a very hot region, either next to the boiler, which is a hot area, or on top of an engine, which has an exhaust pipe, which is also hot. In other words, we try to warm up that piston as much as possible within the engine room, so that the piston expands in its dimensions. And the gajin pin is kept in the deep fridge, in the, in the domestic fridge, up in the galley, in the kitchen. So after a few hours, when that gajin pin reaches a very low temperature, it partially shrinks. So somebody is taken up and he takes a big cloth to wrap up the gajin pin and bring it to the engine room so that the cold gajin pin temperature is maintained. So we bring it immediately, put a little lubricating oil on the gajin pin and simply push it in. And that is how, by a hand pushing or a little tapping in, it goes in. And once the two temperatures start becoming equal, then the piston grips onto the gajin pin. So it is a tight fit. You cannot push it out just like that. You cannot. So in the room temperature condition, the gajin pin is held tightly in the piston. But I do not believe 
that this tightness exists when the engine is running. When the engine is running, the temperature goes up, the piston is hot, and the coefficient of expansion of the piston being aluminum alloy is much higher than the coefficient of expansion of the gudgeon pin, which is of forged steel. So during that time, there will be some movement and the oil which is fed to the gudgeon pin will have holes at that region and allow for some lubrication of that place. But most of the rotation is at the gudgeon pin where the bronze bush of the connecting rod is working on. Okay, that is <clears throat> how it is fitted. Remember, the piston has to be warm and the gudgeon pin has to be cooled, normal cooling in the fridge. And that is the point, it is most easy to fit it in. Otherwise, it's very difficult. It will go without the proper alignment, you can never get it in. So get it marginally, maybe a few microns, in differential temperatures will allow that to fit in. Okay. Next, what we have is, it is fixed centrally with the help of circlips and prevents damage and scoring of the cylinder liner. See, the gudgeon pin, once it's fitted inside the piston, it has to be centrally located. Because if it floats around, when the piston is reciprocating, it will go and hit the liner and it will damage the liner. So the piston itself has a recessed portion which allows the gudgeon pin to protrude, but not behind, beyond the diameter of the piston. And at the ends of the, of the gudgeon pin, there are grooves which clamps onto a circlip. These are called clips. And this helps to retain the central position of the gudgeon pin on the cylinder. So the gudgeon pin cannot shift and hit the liner and cause damage. This will not happen. Okay. It was 1041. At 1045, we'll call it off. Or maybe we'll do little up to 13. Okay, up to 13 we'll do. So Marine, this is the diagram where I showed you, I told you about the bearing width being much larger than the cylinder bore. This cylinder bore is of a certain dimension, but the bearing is much bigger. So you cannot remove the entire assembly from top of the piston, from top of the uh, engine. But after removing the cylinder head, you remove the piston, you cannot take it out because the diameter is much larger. So in this case, you have two studs with nuts which allow you to open up and allow you to withdraw the piston out from the top. And then when you open up the bearing, you can remove it from the crankcase door. Remember, I've copied this from the internet. There are some mistakes here. The terms that are used are not correct. You see, what he says about this number 10, connecting rod bolt. It is not a bolt, it is a nut. So because you can make out it's a nut. And number 11 here said connecting rod nut. You cannot have a bolt and nut at one end. You have a bolt head at one end, not a nut. So be very careful what you see. 10 should have been stud. That's all. And 11 is a nut. That's all. So do not confuse stud and nut anywhere. A stud does not have a head. A bolt has a head. A stud is threaded at both ends. A bolt is threaded at only free end, not the head, of course, cannot be. So be careful of the terms that are used over here. Like number 10 is connecting rod bolt is wrong. It should have been connecting rod stud. And number 11 is all right, connecting rod nut. Similarly, you have number 12. Number 12 at the bottom is also a stud because you don't see any bolt head over here. So this is a stud which is partly fitted inside the upper piece and it passes through the lower piece with a nut holding the lower piece in position. So number 12 should have been connecting rod stud. And similarly, sorry, connecting rod bearing stud. And 13 is all right, connecting rod bearing, bearing nut. No, connecting rod stud nut. Nut for just a nut would have been enough. Just put nut on number 13, stud on number 12. So, this list over here is all humbug. It is not very true. Number 8 is all right, it is a dajin pin. Number 9 is okay, it is a circular 
securing ring. This securing ring is also a circlip. That is the way it is. Compression shim. Compression shim is number five. You see, if you want to change the clearance volume, you have provision here to lift the piston or lower the piston from its position by removing or introducing shims between the connecting rod and the bearing. So this possibility is here, but it is not there in a normal connecting rod here. You cannot change the clearance volume here at all. We can change the clearance here, but that also by putting a shim here, which is not permitted because it's a thin shell bearing. Where thin shell bearings are used, you cannot put shims. So this diagram here allows you to change the clearance volume at the piston and therefore a little bit of the compression ratio. So 1045, this is all we will keep to on number 13. I'm not showing you a video today. I will show you another day. And because of Sumesh Divedi going out of our lives, that means he's not going to come again to our campus for any, any interviews in future. So we are closing this class for today. And I will be sending this lecture through email to all of you. But that's the best I can do right now. And we will again meet in the next class where I will show you a video and continue with our class. So let it be at this point. So that will be all. Uh, side note, on a side note, sir, the class today had 100% attendance, sir, or 38 of the 38. Yes, I can see that. Yes, I can see that. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you, all of you, boys and girls. I'm very happy that all of you are able to attend. More than that, it is important that you all stay in very good health. Don't think you are young and the COVID will only affect you mildly. It has affected young people also. And it is very painful for young people to suffer because the damage is not temporary. It is permanent. There are organs in your body which will remain damaged after the COVID has gone and you have recovered. So do not take chances to take every precaution to continue with those just three things, the mask, social distancing, and washing your hands. Don't worry about anything else. Keep these three fundamental in your lifestyle as of now till you get that vaccine. And the good news is vaccine has come out for Pfizer. And they are saying it has got 90% effectiveness and success. I hope it comes in quickly and helps us to be relieved from this restrictive lifestyle. Anyway, stay healthy, stay safe more than anything else and practice those three habits thoroughly for a long, long time. There is no chance. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir.